Welcome everyone to the September meeting of the Melbourne EV Group. On those, we've got four groups, four groups presenting there um, tonight on some of their innovative ideas on electric vehicles. And uh, we'll start off with some EV news. It's a bit of news of what's been happening around the place. Uh, Tesla have started setting up their supercharged network throughout the east coast of um, east coast of Australia. As you can see, there's two in Melbourne. I've got one here. This one is uh, Albury. Does anyone know where that one is? No. This one's Goulburn, and then up through there, up in Sydney. So they've started setting up the supercharger network. Uh, I went to Sydney last month those to pick up a car that um, I'm repairing and those and we stopped at Goulburn and so when we were got at Goulburn we um, saw that the supercharger network that they're starting to put it in there at Goulburn. So we've got four of the superchargers and then they'll have the bays there as well so it's all underway and um, I think there's four or six cars at the um, Goulburn Visitor Centre. Uh, just to let people know that I've built a conversion box that can be used for charging old level one type cars, you know, that have the standard plug on those from a uh, J1772 from a level two charging station on those. So here I am charging the Vetrix on theirs using the conversion box on those, just the adapter for it there and it's charging at 10 amps charging my scooter. I'm going to have an around the garages on those, which we haven't done for over a year on those. So um, this is the Ford Capri car that I've picked up and that from Sydney. It was converted in 2008, got a standard DC net gain nine inch motor, the typical older style of conversions that were done and with Thunder Sky. Uh, LAFPO4 batteries. So the car went for four or five years on those. Batteries eventually faded out and failed and um, it'll need a battery replacement. So I've had a look at the battery design on it and that's in it and we're going, I'm going to replace it with Panasonic. Um, it'll be a 160 ampere hour pack instead of the original 90 and uh, it actually fits under the rear seat and that in the car. So the cells that we'll be using in this car, the Panasonic cells, they're the same, the same cells and configuration that was used in the Tesla Roadster. So it's a well-known cell on that to use for EVs. And then the car will also need um, a few body repairs as well. It's got a bit of rust just here in the, in the door sills on those. That'll have to be fixed for roadworthy on those, but um, uh, a little bit of work in that needs doing as well. So people will be welcome to come on Saturday the 10th of October. On those, if you want to see me after this, after the meeting, I can give you the address of where it would be on those. But um, yeah, we're going to have a day there where we're going to work on the car, pull the old batteries out, the old Thunder Sky batteries out, and uh, start to configure the new battery pack. And uh, there's a little bit of other mechanical work and that can be done. Um, the battery cells are being constructed at the moment, but it'll take four, six weeks, maybe eight weeks to construct the um, battery cells because uh, it's quite a bit of work and that in uh, configuring and constructing the battery out of these 18650 cells. And uh, we'll have a barbecue lunch there so we can have a bit of social time, a bit of a catch up, chat around and that after we've been looking at and working on the car. And then also coming up, the, um, our group's been asked to go to the um, Festival of Cars, which is at Cruden's Farm down in Langwarren, well-known place, 22nd of November. So I've 
if uh, anyone has a vehicle that are interested in bringing down, we'll have um, charging there. We'll have the, um, the Club Assist portable charging generator there that can charge two cars on at a level two. And there's also three phase power and there's um, the three phase power available at the farm as well. So um, level one cars and that could be charged, could be plugged in and charged there. And so we'll also be able to charge some level two cars. So if you do bring a car down, we'll be able to charge it. So I'll, I'll be coordinating that. So if you want to bring a car down and want to reserve some charging, let me know. Otherwise, some um, members and that and others are people are welcome to come down and have a look. And those will be displaying their electric vehicles as well as all the other things that are there at the day. And that's all the news and that for the moment. So uh, I'll pass over to Clint now, and that who's organised tonight. Thank you very much for what you've done in organising it. And um, this is Clint. Thanks. Um, so I guess most people here know what the go is with tonight. Uh, it's a bit of a change from what we've done in the past. In the past, we've looked at um, EV conversions. We've looked at electric vehicle technologies. We've looked at government policy and infrastructure and things like that. Uh, to round things out, <coughs> pardon me, the plan tonight was to actually look at the commercial side and the entrepreneurial side. I'm hoping, and I can see from some phases here, we've actually got a mix of technical expertise and commercial expertise. Some people are more one than the other, and some people I know are actually a bit of both. So the purpose of tonight is for us to share information with people who are actually having a go at taking some kind of electric vehicle and commercializing it. Uh, it's your chance to ask questions, give advice, find out what, and also just to find out what's actually going on so that we've got a much more rigorous network in the EV space uh, in Melbourne. Just so you know, and that this was pointed out, the reason for the microphone is because we are actually being broadcast at the moment. So if you do have any questions afterwards, the microphone will go to you first, we'll ask a question, we'll come to whoever the speaker is. What we're going to do first is we're going to let each speaker actually say their spiel. They've got to like, you know, five to seven minutes each. Uh, and then we'll ask questions at the end for a brief period. And then what we'll do is after that, we'll sort of, you probably be individuals you'd want to speak to in more in depth and we'll have, um, we'll go to the tea room afterwards and you can speak to them in more detail then. I'm not presenting them in any particular order, um, probably just the order that I'll mention in the Facebook event. So we're actually going to start off with uh, Barry Nguyen from um, EVX. Oh, yeah, round of applause, thank you. Yeah. We're about to see these files on here, I think. Okay, so Clint's advised that we can only spend between five to seven minutes on this. Um, this is actually the full pitch deck we offer often send to people who want a bit more detail about uh, EVX. Um, so I'm Barry, I'm one of the co-founders and um, the CEO of EVX. It used to be called SolarX, but we had a few issues with the name and how it also resembles other established companies in the space. Um, EVX is a pre-revenue startup in collaboration with Swinburne University R&D um, in, in the EV R&D space. Um, we're currently attempting to commercialize uh, a sold sports car that's road legal. Um, the focus is, is around its endurance. So we're in fact paving a new way for a new category of car, uh, which is more focused on endurance based on our inspiration and uh, application of technologies from uh, the World Solar Challenge. So We've actually claimed that it is the world's first bespoke or custom high-performance passenger, uh, passenger sports car powered by the sun called the Immortus. You might have seen that around in um, some media. Uh, we've probably got over about a thousand articles on the internet in various languages at the moment, including Forbes. Um, so just quickly, the specifications around the car, it goes to zero to 100 approximately less than seven seconds. The top speed's over 150 kilometers per hour. Um, that's a combined soul and battery range of 550 kilometers at an average speed of 85 kilometers per hour. Um, it'll weigh between 500 to 700 kilograms. It's only about 40 kilowatts peak output, but it's a lot lighter than um, a mass-produced car. And it has a 10 kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery, which is about uh, 
one ninth of a Tesla Model S's battery at the moment. Has a very very low uh, drag coefficient, um, and it basically seats two people. Um, that's essentially the design of the car. Quite close to the actual one. Once we raise money to commercialize, um, so the technologies is probably where you guys are mostly interested in. Um, so essentially, we've, as a result of the challenges um, producing this car, um, we've innovated in the battery box. It's actually lightweight and double the life of the common one. So, for example. Always reference to Tesla, but we're not trying to be a Tesla. Um, they're a liquid uh, cooled battery box. We are an air cooled to actually minimize the weight, um, which creates different challenges. Um, the other challenge we've innovated in is um, creating lightweight and durable solar panels that fit in the car um, that will be road legal. Um, also, we have regenerative shock absorbers, um, which helps capture the energy from the road and the bumps, which can actually recharge the car in a smaller amount. Um, and the most important one, which we've recently progressed in, is the hub. It's actually not a hub now. Um, it's actually an upright motor that actually clips onto the rim. And the way we've developed it is so uh, we can create a system around making uh, petrol cars easily converted to EV or, or hybrid. So just quickly around them, because it's more of a commercial spill, um, the market opportunity in the car industry is $9 trillion. Um, the custom car industry is around $33 billion. Um, there's a lot of derivative technologies in what we're doing here. Um, there's also a significant amount of advanced manufacturing opportunities and collaborations, particularly in Geelong at the moment, given the demise of auto industry here um, there's also cross industry app, uh, opportunities as as you can see with some of the technologies um, and a hot space at the moment is the digital technology applications too um, you might have seen everywhere people are oh yeah the buzzword is the self-driving car which is supposedly going to be real in two to three years and the connected car which is essentially having the car as an internet platform based on uh, the internet of things, which are devices connected to a cloud and um, collecting data. Um, at the recent Frankfurt uh, Motor Show, International Motor Show, the CEO of uh, GM Motors actually said uh, over the next five to 10 years, there'll be the most change and disruption in the industry ever. And you can start to see that now with Tesla and also helping that is the um, issues with Volkswagen and, and their software which is really good for us um, and people who believe in EVs in the future. So the timing's quite right for this to happen because um, petrol cars will be more expensive due to increase in regulations and things like that, which again aids the type of stuff we're doing. Um, so the business model quickly. So we don't intend to be a manufacturer of this. Um, we're gonna, our model is based on the independent individual constructed vehicles model. What essentially that means is we can actually um, manufacture low volume of these cars, um, particularly in Australia and the US. Um, and we, we essentially contract a custom car builder to assemble the components we put together. Um, where, uh, I mean, we'll make some money from it, um, which we forecast. Um, we, don't sell, we don't plan to sell a lot worldwide, but in particular, we've had serious interest from the US, particularly California and um, the Middle East. Um, in terms of our product, where often there's more money than cents. Um, so you're not talking about the common high net worth individuals, you're talking about the ultra high net worth individuals who are early adopters. And they've, they've spent about $40 billion per year on luxury automotive. So if you're looking at selling 100, that's about 0.01% 0 .01 of the market or something like that. Um, you can do the calculations there. But where, where we plan to make the money is through the car being a technology platform. So from Clint and from Tesla's experience as well, um, you have to build an electric car from ground up. And that's a very cost-effective R&D platform to actually produce spin-off technologies from it. And revenue streams, as I spoke about, are those uh, three different technologies, including the, um, the motor mounting, the regen shocks, and solar cell mounting on panels. Um, so. Essentially, we have a very 
diverse and strong team. I'd say we're probably one of the strongest teams in Australia to do this. We've got Clint, who's considered as a national EV expert. We've got me, who's a bit of a hustler. And we've got Nadasha, who's an IP expert, which essentially is the key to this whole uh, venture. We've got Andres, who used to be the chairman of uh, the Aurora Solar Racing Team. And he brings a lot of experience as an automotive engineer, as well as um, building solar races that are award-winning. Um, we've got a lawyer from uh, Silicon Valley who brings companies here to the US, who's um, on our board. We have Earl Harper, who's um, backdoor listed and IPO'd uh, companies. Um, we also have Joven, who's, have you guys heard of Martin Jetpacks? No, so Jetpack. So essentially, it's one of, I think it's a crazier idea than ours, um, personally. Um, so essentially, it's a Jetpack, like the Jetsons, allows, you know, individuals to fly around in, in the sky. Essentially, they raised $33 million for that and IPO'd the company on stock exchange. So we've got the actual corporate finance people behind that helping us out too. Um, and we've got Ray Keefe, who's amazing in the area of um, electronics manufacturing in Australia. And he works for a lot of uh, venture funded startups in the US as well. Um, some who work actually, some of his team works directly with Steve, uh, previously uh, former Steve Jobs and um, Bill Gates as well. Um, current status, we, we started about three years ago. Um, Started off more as like like an idea and a uni project, but now we're going to SEMA, which is a custom car show in the US in November. Um, we've got some team members here actually who's going to build a scaled down uh, remote control model, which can also be commercialized. And that's a, one of our early ways or cheaper ways to actually showcase some of the technologies there. Um, we're also prototyping, uh, we're going to also show prototype models of some of the things we're showcasing, including the um, regen shock absorbers and the upright, which is the in. Uh, wheel mount, motor mounts. Um, that's got a lot of media attention at the moment to the point where we actually successfully almost finalized a partnership with a private uh, fleet company in Australia to test and distribute the hybrid retrofit technology from the actual upright technology that we're developing on the Hyundai i30, Toyota Corolla and uh, Yaris. So that, that's a pretty big thing for us um, because that's probably going to involve like an, a PhD project, some grants and potential uh, private capital raisings if we push that over the line. And we're also uh, finalizing a partnership with Ray Keefe um, around um, building a device in the car that has uh, advanced self-learning capabilities, which at the moment, the application is more around strategic uh, trip planning and working out where using uh, meteorological data and topic graphical data to actually help um, the driver the driver experience or enhance it um, as I said we've been I'm, I'm quite surprised about this because I mean a lot of people might argue that a lot of people complain that other startups don't actually get as much exposure because we, we don't have a full working scale prototype at the moment but we actually for some reason given Probably our angle, given that we've um, got potential infinite range of the car, which actually takes us into another class outside the Tesla and the rest of it, onto international media, including Forbes, BBC, Gizmag, which we're going to write another article for soon on the hybrid retrofit kit, fast company version. We've also had Chris Brown, who's a uh, musician overseas, he, he, yeah, um, post about us, and Floyd Mayweather, which is that picture there saying that he, he really likes the idea of the car as well. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about ultra high net worth individuals with more money than cents. And <laughs> you want to look radically different. We also got into something a bit more cultural, which is uh, I fucking love science. You guys might have heard of that. Yep. Um, the ultimate vision of EVX is not to be a manufacturer at this stage anyway, um, but it is to make the self-sufficient car the future of transportation, which we believe is possible um, through 
R&D and commercialization of range extension technologies, which is what we are seeing in, uh, to specialize in. Um, yeah, that's the whole spiel for now. Um, you, you guys can ask me questions afterwards. Um, thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Barry. What we'll do is we'll um, save all the questions for like a panel at the end, and then we might move over elsewhere. Um, I'll get Rod from EV Solar to come up next um, and give us his presentation. A round of applause there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Clint, for inviting me this evening. Um, I'll just. Oh, okay. I'll have to double click on it, do I? Sorry, I thought we moved that one over with Nanota. Apologies. Doesn't mean USB. It's my fault. Hi. I did get to it. Not exactly a great way to start a presentation. These things happen. So, look, uh, I'm just going to try and keep. I'm going to try and keep to um, the, uh, the format uh, laid out um, by by Clint, and I'm going to put my little timer on so I don't go over time. Um, that might be a little bit annoying for everyone. So, just uh, quickly, a little bit about uh, myself. Um, I've, uh, I suppose, been around in industry, being and doing uh, clean, green, humanitarian things, and uh, as you notice, they are put socialist in, 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 a, in a smaller font there, uh, because I'm a little bit that way. Um, uh, and basically what I've been doing um, for my entire career is essentially helping industrial organizations, um, you know, do things better, reformulating their processes. Um, and uh, that's basically uh, led to me, um, you know, helping people produce the products that they produce in a more energy efficient way, uh, in a cleaner, greener way. Um, and that uh, way of looking at the world uh, has uh, kept me on this you know, course of uh, uh, developing new things. Um, and I found myself over the years developing new IP. Uh, and uh, more recently, it's been a little bit more focused, um, you know, developing a new IP around clean energy uh, I was uh, involved with, uh, uh, you know, when carbon capture and sequestration was uh, a sexy thing to do. I was um, leading the development uh, in that space. Um, that led to, you know, uh, development of what actually required new types of energy generation systems that led to you know, things like flash gasification and ambient pressures and and uh, you know developing new generating hardware and all that sort of stuff. A lot of these things are very much at the extreme leading edge, uh, and it allowed me to 
um, you know, work with uh, some really, really smart people and do um, lots of uh, uh, in-depth multi-physics analysis of, of all sorts of stuff. And we were, um, uh, you know, uh, pushing the envelope with respect to computational analysis and modeling and all that sort of stuff. Um, and I've progressively, you know, to also, uh, uh, you know, as part of, my, I suppose, my personal journey, um, always wanting to, you know, contribute to the greater good uh, of, of humanity. Um, I, I find myself working a, a lot more in the area of, of food production uh, and uh, water treatment and, uh, and provision of water systems. Um, and progressively, um, I've found myself, you know, involved in the in, in the transportation, you know, doing transportation solutions. That basically came out of um, developing new IP for, um, for for power generation. We discovered that yes, we can do, you know, power generation much much uh, more cleaner. Uh, but when you look at what contributes to to global warming, power generation is only half of the equation. The other half of the equation really is is transportation. It contributes significantly. You know, to, to climate change, global warming, and, and just pollution in general, um, and um, that's something that I'm passionate about. And so, uh, uh, in the last few years, last five years, in fact, uh, I've been focusing more and more on developing new solutions um, for um, tr you know cleaner, greener transportation, which has basically um, led me to earlier this year um, start this uh, this new venture. Uh, which is essentially um, a, a subsidiary spin-out of the, uh, the primary business, which is called um, Prasignus uh, Proprietary Limited. And Prasignus is essentially a company that develops these sorts of technologies. Um, and we uh, naturally, because we're doing a lot of development work, um, we look for opportunities to, you know, uh, generate uh, uh, revenue. Uh, and... Um, uh, this basically uh, gave birth to, uh, to to solar EV. We basically saw uh, that um, uh, we needed to have um, some stepping stones um, laid down, or, and we should contribute towards laying down those, those those stepping stones because of the technologies that we are in the process of developing, and you know will commercialise in the next five to ten years. So. Um, is if you, if you don't stay with the pack, um, you know, um, you, you basically lose ground. Um, so what we basically, what, what we've done is we've set up um, Solar EV as, uh, as, a, as, a, as an entity that is basically going to be a transition leader. And by that I mean a organization that um, is going to assist in the transition into this new era of um, electric vehicles. Um, but we also want to do it differently. We want to do it, you know, cleaner and greener. Um, that's just, you know, that's why I said those things about myself before. That's, that's, that's how I like to do things. Um, and so um, we didn't really want to just produce EVs um, that was essentially then going, you know, be like lots of the others. It just plugs into the grid. What we wanted to do is we wanted to see whether we could actually do EVs in a way that um, you could actually... Um, integrate with um, solar charging stations. Use the sun as the as the uh, primary provider of that energy, rather than the grid. You know, which is back to you know conventional power. Um, so we went through an exercise of um, investigating, analysing the market, which is the right space to move in, where do we start, which is the biggest market opportunities, and all those sorts of things. Um, and that, geez, that went quick. <laughs> That basically led to us deciding that um, they, we have the Teslas of the world uh, and now you can see that Audi and um, BMW and all the, the big leading car manufacturers are all racing towards delivering EVs and it's all going to basically be to satisfy you know, the, uh, the needs of the people who have really, really deep pockets. Uh, and we thought, well, that's not all that fair, especially when we discovered that you know, people um, who need transportation and need transportation, um, you know, uh, cheaply, you know, looks like they're not going to be addressed. So 
who developed this business model uh, whereby um, we satisfied um, the requirements of a significant part of our community. Um, and that is essentially our stepping stone, our first, um, uh, you know, uh, introduction, our first solution that we're going to be um, rolling out. And, and it bas it's, in, in simple terms, basically what it is, it's essentially the delivery of a service whereby we provide uh, electric vehicles, and initially we're starting off, starting out by providing electric bikes, and I'm doing that in conjunction with Brad Smith, and some of you guys know that guy already. Um, he's into the bike manufacturing business, um, and I've persuaded him to do an electric bike. And so the the uh, the, the business basically provides, um, on a leasing basis, um, electric bikes um, to people who are spending a lot of money on on transportation anyway, and those are the people that basically. Uh, and don't have really deep pockets. Um, so our focus there is to provide the service to uni university students. Um, and these are the people too that um, are uh, our buyers of electric vehicles in the future. So we see that as a uh, contribution that we're making is to assist the transition, um, you know, and work with the people that have the right mindset around all these things. Um, Eventually, uh, our technology and our, and our, and our solutions uh, will be, um, you know, rolled out to, you know, um, uh, uh, to cater for all sorts of um, uh, transport. But our starting point is essentially um, uh, electric bikes because we can do it at the right price point. Um, and I'll just quickly go through that. Uh, so our starting point is essentially a, a business whereby we lease. Uh, electric uh, vehicles and although I mentioned students, we've got a lot of interest from people outside the student community, um, private industry, government departments, all that sort of stuff are wanting to do, you know, adapt or take on our model or have us work with them with that model um, to provide other types of vehicles as well other than just electric um, uh, bikes. So in our first iteration, starting point, student e-bikes, what we basically can, what we're offering is um, a, a, a lease of a bike um, that is a road legal, road legal, road legal vehicle, um, complete with, you know, registration, insurance, uh, it includes maintenance, repairs, roadside assistance. Um, and this is the, the important aspect of our business, is we provide free 24-hour 24 ac 24 access to our solar charging station network. Um, and so students can basically come along, recharge their vehicle when the sun is shining. They don't have to take their vehicle home at night and plug it into the wall, which is a bit like the Tesla model, I suppose. And as we know, they are evolving and, and looking at doing solar as well. Um, so we had to also you know, develop the solution that was going to be at the right price point. So we've basically worked it out that we can do it for $7.25 a day. Um, and um, yeah, so basically the business model is that we are a build and operate and expand business with an exit strategy because we have other technologies that we will eventually be bringing in. Um, and, um, you know, we uh, enter into, you know, um, uh, joint venture agreements with um, uh, electric or vehicle manufacturers. Uh, those aren't all um, companies that are focusing on electric vehicles. These are also traditional um, vehicle manufacturers as well. Okay, so I think I've probably, well, I, I have definitely um, said I've gone over my time, but these are just, um, uh, you know, a, a, an illustration of essentially how we, we basically make the money, um, starting essentially, you know, simplistically small, um, and um, uh, with a you know a clear definitive roll rollout program, um, we've done our modelling, and it basically says that you know, and that this is the important thing: that there had to be a good return on investment. Um, you know, I've, I've been playing in developing and commercialising um, new technologies, and a lot of these things don't get up because the numbers basically don't stack up, or you don't have a system of implementing your technology or your process um, to actually deliver you a, a return in the future and over the long term. 
I just want to quickly, I'm, I'm taking up somebody else's time, um, the, uh, Clint asked me to address the, some of the, the impediments that, uh, that, that I've experienced, observed in this particular space. Um, and really, um, the, the only two um, that, uh, that is problematic uh, is people's fears um, and, and their egos. Um, and we've, you know, we know the solutions for these sorts of things. Uh, you know, when you have a fear, we can address that essentially by, uh, you know, by educating people appropriately. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been around long enough to know how to do that extremely well. Um, and of course, the other thing that impedes us from making progress uh, is, is people's egos. Um, you know, we deal with people across a whole heap of a large gamut of, of enterprises, bureaucrats and, all, and politicians, all that sort of stuff. And you tend to, you know, bump into these sorts of things all the time. And the way we basically deal with that, we simply just, you know, avoid them at all costs because the resource pool uh, for all, all the things we require, whether it's hardware or whether it's capital, money, um, you know, it's a, it's a very vast pool that we can basically draw from. So thank you very much. And uh, that's it for me. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, next up was uh, Ali of um, was it Flash Rescue. Yeah, Flash Rescue. Can you do lift those up? The camera goes to the, the camera can see as well. Anyway, round of applause for Ali. Thanks. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Ali. I'm an industrial designer. Um, this is an idea that I worked through my final semester at university, and it's more of a concept. And I asked Clinton, for me, this is a really good opportunity just to share the idea and um, see what it, everyone's feedback on it. Um, the issue that I was uh, focusing on was basically about emergency vehicles and especially fire brigades and the amount of responses that they have whilst taking a huge amount of water. And there are a lot of calls that they receive which they do not need to carry that massive truck with that much water. And some cases such as animal rescues or small bin fires and sometimes car accidents. And these, uh, these scenarios sometimes cost up to three to $4,000 uh, without being a serious scenario. Um, then I focused more on bin fires and car accidents. I did some research on the cost of uh, bin fires, which is uh, extremely high, around $900,000 a year only in Melbourne. And in the CBD area, there are 76 bin fires um, happen only in one year. Uh, and all of them uh, attend around three, uh, the cost is around $3,000 each time. Also, the, um, um, the car accidents, it's around, it's, it's around 5,500 5, per year, and fire brigade does need to attend when there is someone trapped in the vehicle or if there is any um, car explosion uh, might happening. So my solution was flash rescue. Oh, sorry. Yep. Um, it's basically a, an emergency vehicle and a small size emergency vehicle uh, based on Segway platform designed to uh, respond to small fires and car accidents rapidly and in, in mostly in CBD areas. Uh, the size of the vehicle has been really tried to minimize um, because it avoids traffic jams and sometimes it's, when it's needed to be taken to the footpath, people can take it there. Um, 
And also, the design is able to carry two firemen as well as two uh, fire extinguishers. It does also have um, a first aid kit for just some minor issues to be resolved. Um, and the other advantages of this design, in my perspective, is um, efficiency and minimizing CO2 emissions as well as the uh, as well as the running cost in compared to now uh, the current extra large fire brigades. This is a general overall size of the platform. Um, it's around one and a half meter, and when the extension, which the, ex the extension is basically designed to carry tools for car accidents, sometimes they need to uh, carry hydraulic shears and etc. So the extension, with the extension, is going to be around two and a half meters. Uh, I was really uh, really interested in EV um, technology. I worked with the solar team for a little while in the interior design team, and it really attracted me to work on this area. And basically because there is no direct pollution, the energy is cheaper, uh, it's not as complex as mechanical and uh, cars as well. And for instance, there is no oil needed for it, and the less energy is, is wasted, and pretty much no energy is wasted when the vehicle, vehicle is not running. Also, I found out that mixing the technology with Segway technology can be a really good idea to improve some aspects of EV. Uh, the potential buyers of this product is mainly um, the CBD fire services. Uh, I've had a look at the number of uh, fire services in different cities across Australia. Uh, out of 47 uh, Metropolitan Fire Brigade stations in Melbourne, four of them are located in CBD, and there are as well, four uh, fire stations in Sydney CBD and two in Brisbane, and each fire service can buy around three um, between three to five uh, units of this vehicle. Also, the design is it is compatible with other uh, scenarios, such as it can be used in sport complexes, and as well as residential and business buildings. Um, the size allows. The vehicle to get into the goods goods lift and just uh, go and uh, rescue or uh, extinguish the fire, and also in shopping centres, there are lots of minor fires happens in shopping centres, and flash rescue can be a good idea to attend quickly and respond uh, rapidly to them. As it's in, uh, in its conceptual stage, um, basically we need a, a team of the engineers to work on and develop the idea, as well as uh, some aspects of, such as the energy storage unit, which can be a combination of solar powers and battery packs, and also the control unit, which I mentioned before, is a mixture of uh, Segway technology and EV technology. Uh, the marketing it does have the potential of uh, growing in internationally, and also in Australia. We also need to do some safety tests and as well as considering the manufacturing uh, cost and facilities. There are some more informations on my website and thanks for all the attention. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Now, is it Baja board or Baja board? Baja, yeah, all right. Fine, you're right. All right. Do you want to stand up here, do you? Fine. Yeah, so it's Baja board. All right, George from Baja board now. Thanks. Hello everyone. Uh, how do I get out of this? Uh, can I close this down? Uh, how do I get back to things? Oh, hold on, that's not right. Hello everyone, I'm George from uh, Baja Board, I'm one of the co-founders and my other two teammates are behind, right at the back, because they're naughty. Now Baja Board is a electric skateboard, but that's really not saying too much about it. We've actually got two of the boards right there, the, uh, the one with the orange spring is going to Sweden tomorrow, so try not to scratch it. As opposed to me talking about it, 
I thought I will show you a video of what the actual board is so that uh, it can do the board a bit more justice than what I can say. There's no sound to it anyway. Is there a sound? Oh. So yeah, so that's the Baja board, and the Baja board is, uh, in a sense, it's an electric skateboard, but it's an electric skateboard in this format, a fundamental design of a car. So full suspension, independent steering, and uh, four-wheel drive, including the electronic differential. Headlights, taillights, optional. Now, this is a traditional electric skateboard, so your typical single-axle trucks you see on normal skateboards. To go off-road, they put some big wheels onto it, one motor at the back. The issue is not a lot of power, can't really handle the off-road in the same sense. You can drive your Toyota Prius onto a gravel car park, but you can't really go driving off-road with it. Our value proposition. So why would people want to buy ours? Well, because of the suspension system, it has much better riding dynamics. It's got a lot more power. It's more robust. I ride stronger there, but should be more robust. It takes a lot more punishment. And given the slightly higher ride height and the shock absorption, it takes the off-road terrain a lot better. And that's actually not just from me, but from some of our customers. There's one of our early adopters who's uh, from WA looking to start a Baja board club there. And he provides us with feedback on his board, which we delivered about a month and a half ago. Now, this year we've sold... 50 beta boards, and the point of the beta boards was to get our hands dirty, um, find out how long it takes to pr produce per day, uh, the cost involved, and most importantly, the customer feedback. We're all about talking to the customer, private customers and dealers, and getting their feedback so that we can improve the product and tailor it to what they want. Uh, we have, at the moment, 1,750 pre-order mailing list subscribers. And it's increasing by four. That should really be five a day with uh, no paid marketing. This is all word of mouth. And we have, we're have we talking to, at the moment, Finland distributors and uh, the, some guy in the Netherlands about getting some boards made for them uh, after mid next year. This is one of our other um, customers who provides a little feedback. He's very happy about the board. And this is part of the traction we're talking about, not just with individuals, but we're also in contact with some pretty well-known people that's offering us opportunities. So, for example, we're in contact with Mark Preston from the uh, Formula E Super Guru team, who's you know, giving us a bit tip, few tips on uh, how we're going to run it, as well as offering some cross-promotional opportunities down the track. This is one of the uh, Kelly brothers. Now, I might get exiled here for um, talking about V8s, but uh, 
you know, we, we reached out to him as a potential investor a while ago for a bit further down the track, not necessarily at the moment. And uh, he's very interested. At the moment, Bathurst is almost on, so not a very good time. So we said, look, we'll give you a month and we'll come back to it after that. Our target audience. Now, we don't actually target skateboarders for the simple reason that the price point of the Baja board is between three to $4,000. And so we don't expect someone going to a shop looking to spend 100 bucks on a skateboard to suddenly fork out $3,000. So we're looking at middle-aged men, um, and it is men. About 99% of our followers on Facebook is male, uh, who participate in snowboarding, mountain biking, motocross, and surfing. So someone who is willing and open to spending a few thousand dollars for a weekend away and has that sort of budget. Now the market size, it's nice to think about the 1.9 billion, but we're really looking at what we can actually achieve in the short term. Um, and that's based on our pre-order list of people that's interested in uh, purchasing when it's ready, <coughs> as well as the contacts we have with distributors. And we estimate that within the next two years, we can reach about $8 million worth of uh, revenue if we got the funding to go ahead. Now, we have four revenue streams, three from a month ago, but we developed the last one very recently. So obviously, board sales is number one. Uh, we got those price points from A, we know how much it costs to produce the board, but we have also been going around to different shops in Melbourne, talking to the, uh, the retailers and saying, look, what do you think? the customers are willing to pay for it. And the answer is usually about the $3,000 mark. And the idea isn't to sell it for three or three to eight, is to give them a base model at about three and then let the customer option it up. Like on Tesla's website, if you go there, it's $100,000. You spend a few minutes on it, and suddenly it's $200,000. So we want to give them that option. Uh, part sales, we've already started to sell parts. People that's got the board already, um, Tires wear out in about a month, month and a half. So we've been selling tires pretty consistently. Uh, and no one has crashed it yet. So no one has bought any of the other parts yet. But tires and drive belts are the two consumables that's ongoing. Merchandise, something we'll look at in the future, protective equipment. And we're also thinking about, you know, people talk about data um, and how can you engage the customer continuously. And so we thought, look, People are going to need consumables, so why not give them a maintenance subscription process so they don't have to pay any big spend on a part if they do break it. Pay us 60 bucks a month. Every month we'll give you some tires. You don't have to think about it. You have new tires every month to ride. Once a year, we'll replace the batteries for you. It takes about a year to run out. Um, and you get the firmware updates and all the support we give you, as well as a phone app that lets you track the stats and compete with other riders on lap times or tracks and uh, you know top speeds and g-forces and whatever because every one of our customers at the moment has come back to us and said look i use you know runkeeper or diablo tracking app and i i got 47 k's an hour out of this this morning so people like that our team uh the core team is myself uh, and james murphy who's in the back and alessandro they will introduce themselves later on uh, we all come from a professional engineering background. Alessandro and James are more technical. I came from a consulting business development background, so I look after the overall business. James and Alessandro looks after the uh, the tech side. We have a production partner in uh, MTM who is down in Oakley South. They make Tomcars, which is, they argue, a bigger version of the Baja board. Eh, they can say that. We are part of a mentoring program within the Australian Sports Technology Network, who is offering us quite an extensive introduction to distribution contacts around the globe. And through them, we've got you know, legal guys and uh, accounting guys working with us. And we do have product liability insurance, if anyone's wondering. Now, I have to ask for some money. So in the immediate short term, we're talking the next month, we're looking for $30,000 to uh, do a company restructure get the distribution agreements ready so we can actually go and talk to these Netherlands and Finland guys properly without saying, oh, we'll come back in a month and give you some documents. Get some demo boards going. People are asking for it. You know, the distributor is saying, can, I, can you send me a board so that I can test it out and I can place an order to you after that. And for our round one, we're looking for about $300,000, but there is a catch. We're only looking for that provided. We can also get match funding from the Accelerating Commercialization Program. So we're going to put our balls on the line and say, look, 
We need half a million. If we can't get the due diligence done on the government, we're not going to take your money. If that passes and we get the match funding, 300K. So in total, 500K. We're about six to nine months away from market. We've got a product that works. We've got the customer feedback. We know people want it. We know there's interest. We know the price point. We know what we can achieve in terms of production cost. And we know the margins and so forth. And so really, it's about a matter of going through the mass production engineering, which is the longest lead item. That's going to take about six months. And that's what dictates the whole program. Uh, we'll start marketing. I mean, at the moment, all the regional market is dependent on the fact that we do no marketing. We just keep going as we're going and adding four people to the list a day. But if we do marketing, we can, you know, we can double or triple that quite easily. Convert those 2,000 people on the list, 3,000 people by the time we're ready to sell. Get the partnerships going with distribution. Get the certification tooling, manufacturership out and so forth. And that is my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, any questions? Yep. Just a sec. Um, for George, do you know what happens when the controller loses connection? Yes, it, uh, the ball shuts off automatically. It goes into braking mode or stop. Any other questions? Yeah, to uh, Barry and the and the Solar X, or sorry, uh, EVX. Now, um, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about, without uh, giving away your IP, about the upright um, motor scenario? So I understand before you were looking at uh, hub motors, and now you've got this new fandangled um, uh, way of uh, powering the wheels. Could you tell us a little bit about that? So we have our chief, chief uh, technology officer here, luckily. So there's only a certain amount we can actually review on that, but from some of our analysis, um, we've actually realized that the hub motor on the solar racer does not suit uh, road going usable vehicles um clint did you want to comment on that uh essentially when you're looking at hub motors you want me to stand here i guess um is this, can you actually see me no all right so <laughs> people in internet land can just land can just listen um the way the hub motors are set up is that they don't have the right torque curve for the kind of applications you want on the road when they're in when they're actually in the motor so by integrating with the hub, we can put in a gearbox, we can use different motors and things like that and actually have a ratio that makes them operate more efficiently when you're stopping and starting and things like that. Solar cars get up to speed and they pretty much stay there. So that was the reason why we're looking at integrating it to the suspension system um, so that we can have a reduction in there as well, essentially. To match the motor more effectively to the job that needs to be done. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, the skateboard, uh, does this mean we're going to see kids hooning around all over the place or are you going to sort of recommend where they're going to use these boastfully? Yes, uh, number one, it can be used on private property. It's not road, it's not a street vehicle, so don't ride on the roads. Uh, we do tell people that. We've actually been t contacting all the local councils about whether or not we can ride in the parks and we find it is a council by council uh, issue. So some councils say, look, as long as you don't be a nuisance, wear your helmet and stay under the speed limit. Yes, you can. You know, Melton Council, for example, they say you can ride in our parks. Closer to the city, people tend to say no. Uh, Glen, you know, just to give an example, Glen Ara Council said no, uh, no way, Jose. So 
So you've got to count, contact your local council and find out exactly where you can ride it or you can just hop one neighbourhood over and go there. Um, yeah, and farms and anywhere else. That's why it's off-road because no, technically no electric skateboard is road legal. And so we have the fallback and say, look, take it to the farm. Don't ride on the road, right? Any other questions? Yep. Sorry, um, for solar EV, it's, it's I checked out the numbers for the um, day by day. It's seven twenty five a day, but if you do it day by day for a month, it's seven. It's two fifteen. Was it two twenty one a month? If you're doing it a month, the, the, the billing is basically. Oh, sorry. The, the the billing is on a monthly cycle. Yeah. So, you know, there's different number of days in each month. So. Anybody else? Yep. My question was for uh, Baha Board. On those, I was wondering about your association with Tom Carr and that how that came about and um, how does the tooling and that work with there? How, how is that association working with your manufacturing? So the association with MTM, not necessarily Tom Carr. Tom Carr, we are talking about doing some cross promotions uh, next year. But with MTM, we just went to meetups, uh, you know, meetup.com, find the meetups when their CEO or one of the directors was talking. We dragged the board there, I think, and it was a 3K walk. At the time, the board wasn't working. And we stayed there all the way till 12 o'clock at night and we talked to them and they'd introduced us to MTM. And that's how we came about um, with MTM. Uh, in terms of manufacturing, we're at the moment making the board ourselves and they're overlooking how we make it and giving us, uh, taking that into their assembly procedures. Uh, we're going to go through a redesign phase with their input because in the end, if they're going to make it, they should have a saying how they want to make it and what's the quickest way. Uh, that's part of that mass production uh, engineering process we uh, showed up before. And uh, ultimately, we want to hand over the, we might supervise them for a few months, but we want, to, we want them to be making it. We buy X numbers of them every month, on sell it, and then we can go away and think about aftermarket parts and new product development and the whole shebang. We don't want to be sitting there getting hands dirty. 50, 100 is enough. Right? <laughs> Any other questions? Yep, just a sec. I'm into the little red fire engine. Um, I noticed with every major fire, there's a big red truck out the front, so I think there's an association there. Um, but one of the points you made was that you could take this uh, device up in the lift, which are out of bounds during a fire. So um, I think that's not a practical solution. So, yeah, um, I mentioned that those ones, they are, they can be also other potential bars of the product. Um, but I've worked in the security industry for a while and the good lift is usually separated to other residential lifts and we do sometimes use it to go upstairs without having an issue with, with that, yeah. Generally, firemen have override keys for lifts anyway. Any other questions? Let me just pass that one up. Uh, yes, to the uh, to uh, the the fire engine. Um, uh, have you uh, spoken at all to uh, Segway? Because it seems to me it's some um, it, it's pretty much like um, a Segway with a like an enhanced shell on it. Uh, maybe it needs um, a, a little bit more power. Um, and also, um, what sort of um, weight and uh, payload would uh, would your um, device have what sort of um, parameters? You know, like uh, run time and payload. Uh, those sort of um, issues. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. These are the challenges that I'm facing because in, I'm just a designer at the moment. Uh, but yeah, basically, Segway technology is a balancing system and can be adopted with uh, with batteries at the same time. So the Segway platform is just mostly for balancing up the, the individual um, vehicle by itself. And 
definitely all those um, power and torques that it needs to be made and um, it does need further information and uh, more engineer side of it yeah yes, I, <clears throat> it's about time Paul do you think to wrap up and head upstairs and yeah so all I'll do now is um, if you've got another question we're all about to head up to level six to the tea room I'll go unlock it um, there'll be biscuits coffee things like that and also a chance to just speak to everybody one-on-one -on -one up there uh, just before I do that though a round of applause for everybody who presented thanks